All right. Good morning, folks. This is the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission. It is Wednesday, May 1st, and this is our weekly agenda. We will start with the roll call. Commissioner Ackerman. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Ray. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have five of seven commissioners present. Great. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to our weekly agenda. We have 74 folks attending with us. Uh, we will start with commissioner comments. Seeing no comments, we will move to consent. Does anyone have questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, do we have a motion in favor of consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we now will move to the next item on our agenda. This is uh, Conference of Area Plan Docket 22120282, Commission Consideration of Save the Aurora Reservoir Request for Rule 511 Local Public Hearing. Uh, do we have anybody that's going to tee this up for us? Chair, um, Director Murphy? I can offer some thoughts. I um, I would also flag that we received a similar request, and I'm sorry I'm staring up. Um, I'm trying to deal with a different computer configuration. We also received a similar request from the county, um, the Arapahoe County Commissioners. Um, so there are two pending requests for um, a local public hearing. Um, this is related to the Lowry cap, which was filed um, with staff maybe a year ago. It has also been going through some local government processes. Um, it's something that we've been receiving significant interest on. Um, we've been engaging, staff has been engaging with multiple other regulatory agencies on it. And um, right now it's slated for a late June hearing on the cap itself. Um, I believe public comment closes Friday and a protest deadline runs soon. And I think that this is also the first request for a local public hearing we received from a local government since adoption of our new rules. I, I hope that's enough context. Um, I know that your attorney has read into it as well and um, or our attorney, Mr. Davenport has read into it as well if you have questions about the process. Okay, great. And I'm looking at Rule 511 since this is new. Maybe I'll read into the record a little bit about what it says so that folks are apprised about our local public hearing rule. This is Rule 511, 511A. Any person may request the commission hold a local public hearing to gather feedback from the local community, including elected officials and local government officials on a proposed oil and gas development plan, or in this case, a comprehensive area plan. The commission will decide whether to grant the request for a local public hearing. The commission has discretion to decline a request for a local public hearing or in the alternative to hold the local public hearing at the commission's offices. This was obviously drafted well before COVID and Zoom. The commission may choose to hold a local public hearing on its own motion. The commission also has the discretion to designate a single commissioner, administrative law judge or hearing officer to preside at the local public hearing. Uh, that's basically it. Um, I know the Lowry cap is an important proposal before us. Uh, I know that uh, the Arapahoe County officials are interested in holding a local public hearing, as is this one group. I'm inclined to be in favor of granting a request for a local public hearing. I'm inclined to grant that request uh, to be held uh, in person somewhere in Arapahoe County that is near and close to where people can uh, participate. Uh, I'm inclined that we, you know, sort of direct our staff to go ahead and make that happen. Uh, Ms. Larson, I know you had visualized yourself and perhaps given us some ideas about dates. If I recall correctly, May 16th is kind of the one date that might work for everybody's calendars. Is that right? Correct. Um, May 16th does, in fact, work for all commissioners. So if the commission wished to entertain that date, um, we could go ahead and start working on the logistics to get this put together. And we would do it like 
uh, early late afternoon or something like yeah, that. Late, late afternoon, afternoon into early evening. Correct. And find an appropriate location that is conducive for folks to be able to appear. Correct. Okay. Um, I'm good with that. Uh, commissioners, are you good with uh, allowing for the local public hearing? Yes. I don't know that um, uh, Commissioner Messner raised his hand. Commissioner McGowan gave a thumbs up. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just have a question. I, I am in favor of the local public hearing. Um, no question. I think it's an important process and appreciate that both the local government and one of the stakeholders is interested in um, uh, asking for that. Um, I do want to just ask about any notice requirements that we have for the public hearing um, from a timing standpoint to ensure that we give people enough time to get it on their calendars and be able to participate. Um, I know that the May 16th is something that works for us, um, but I wonder if we wanna be a little flexible with that date in coordinating with Arapahoe County to make sure that it works for them as well. Um, and that we give enough people enough time for that to be noticed so that people know that it's happening and that we're able to get the participation that, that we hope. I don't yeah. know what the commissioner. Go ahead, Ms. Larson. Are. So um Commissioner Mesner, we did reach out to Arapaho Arapahoe County late yesterday afternoon to let them know that we were A going to be considering this request this morning. Um and we have checked at least the calendar for the county commissioner meetings. We know that they're not meeting on the 16th or the um, of May. Um, certainly, we will continue to coordinate with Arapahoe County, and we do have um, uh, plans to get a meeting on the books for this week to discuss logistics. And when it comes to getting the word out to the larger community, we would hopefully by this afternoon be able to have this information posted on our website, at least noting that we will be holding the meeting on the 16th um, date or location and time to be determined um, and working with the community groups who are particularly interested in this event as well to let them know that this is coming. So um, I, certainly we had hoped to have a little more time between a decision and when the meeting would happen. Unfortunately, um, calendars are just quite busy <laughs> between now and into June. Um, and in order to have all commissioners available for the meeting, um, the 16th really was the only day available. Okay. Uh, I think the direction has been so given. Everybody be aware, we're gonna have a meeting on May 16th in Arapahoe County, and we look forward to having everybody there and taking public comment. Uh, we should obviously also make sure the applicant is aware of the meeting um, and we will post all this to our website uh, in as quick a uh, fashion as we can. Don't know that we need a motion, uh, Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I just think it probably would be prudent to make sure that the public knows that this will not be the final hearing on the Lowry Crap, but but just public comment just to reiterate that fact. So reiterated. Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering, I guess it's going to depend on, um, I think Arapahoe County hopefully will be willing to host us someplace or find a location that we could use that would be able to accommodate. Are we going to provide uh, interpretation, child care, snacks? That's all for our staff to figure out. We'll do all the things that we need to try to do. Chair, if I can. Yep. Uh, yes, you know, we've been working with um, folks to help us do better on our community outreach, and we will be working with that same group and keeping in mind all of the um, guidelines from the EJ task force around how to how to cope, best structure a public meeting. Great. All right, anything further on, on this topic? Awesome. Look forward to seeing everybody on May 16th in the mid late afternoon early evening somewhere in an appropriate location in Arapahoe county uh we've got uh, two other matters on our docket first is docket 23010017 an oil and gas development plan on schultz exploration corporation um 
why don't we take five and get uh, Ms. Wazalinki and Ms. Jost up and running with their witnesses and return at 9.18. And we are considering docket 23010017. Uh, we will start with the swearing in of the witnesses, if everyone can visualize themselves, and then we'll get Ms. Mercer to do the oath. Good morning. Is this um, the panel, Ms. Wasilenki? It is, although we are missing Laura Johnson. So I know Angelica is looking for her. Maybe we can um, do the swearing in. And if we find her and admit her, um, we can swear her in either at the end or, or before she talks, if she does talk. That sounds good. Um, well, good morning to the panelists. I'll go one by one in the order that I see you on my screen and just ask that you raise your right hand, state your name, and that you swear to tell the truth. Um, I'll begin with Ms. Hill. Holly Hill, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Mr. Levon? Taylor Levon, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Ms. Lott? Whitney Lott, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Ms. Bland? Jennifer Bland, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Boslinki, the uh, video panel is yours. Wonderful, thank you. We'll get our PowerPoint up and then I will get started. Perfect. Well, good morning, commissioners. Again, my name is Kelsey Wazalinki with Jost Energy Law. And with Jamie Jost, we represent Anschutz Exploration Corporation in the Sylvester Fed 0397-12 OGDP before you today in docket 2301-00017. We would like to thank Moffitt County for its support of the Sylvester Fed OGDP and also ECMC staff, Taylor Elm with CPW, and the director for their efforts on this OGDP. Next slide. I'll take just a few minutes to summarize the Sylvester Fed OGDP and requested relief before I turn it over to Anschutz. This OGDP requests that the commission establish an approximate 2,560 acre OGDP for the development of six new horizontal wells in the Niobrara Formation. The Sylvester Fed OGDP also requests that the Commission approve one new Form 2A for the Sylvester Fed 0397-12 pad for the development of six new horizontal wells. Both the proposed surface location and mineral development area are located within the 22,960-acre Wiley Federal Exploratory Unit. Due to federal unit requirements, the mineral development area for the OGDP is subject to a future BLM paying well determination. However, the OGDP application defines four sections as anticipated mineral development for this OGDP, subject to the BLM's confirmation after the wells are drilled and producing. To briefly answer a commissioner question on this issue, it will be further discussed during our presentation, but the primary consideration within federal units is that spacing is vacated within the unit as long as the wells that are drilled prove to be economic. In the event that the BLM determines that a well is not economic, Anschutz would have to come back to the ECMC to request a spacing for that well since it didn't meet the BLM's requirements for a unit well. If there are any additional questions about this process, the team will be ready to address them at the end of the presentation. The Sylvester Fed Pad is located within Moffitt County, Moffitt County does not have oil and gas siting regulations. However, Anschutz has been in close communication and consultation with Moffitt County throughout the OGDP process and will obtain all required pre-construction administrative permits from Moffitt County as needed. Anschutz also consulted with Rio Blanco County regarding the proposed haul routes and associated road maintenance. The proposed Sylvester Fed location triggers two Rule 304 ALA criteria it is immediately upgradient from a mapped wetland, and it falls within CPW mapped, mapped elk, elk winter concentration area and severe winter range. In addition, the access road and pipelines run through the elk winter concentration area and severe winter range, 
greater sage grouse priority habitat, mule deer migration corridor and winter habitat, pronghorn migration corridor and migration habitat, and sport fish management waters. Anschutz will describe its extensive consultation with CPW for the Sylvester Fed location and proposed alternative locations and CPW's Rule 1202A3 waiver for disturbance and chemical, of, and chemical storage within 500 feet of an intermittent drainage. As part of the Sylvester Fed OGDP, Anschutz has committed to several BMPs to avoid, minimize, and mitigate potential adverse impacts, which Anschutz will describe today. And finally, Anschutz has complied with all notice requirements for the Sylvester Fed OGDP. No formal petitions were filed and no public comments were received on the Form 2A. And with that, I will turn it over to Holly Hill to continue the presentation. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, I'm Holly Hill. I'm a regulatory consultant for Anschutz. This is just a brief overview of the things we're going to discuss today. I'm not going to read them all to you, um, and I'll move on to the next slide. Um, Anschutz Exploration Corporation is based in Denver, Colorado. It's a private, independent oil and gas company with assets here in Colorado in the Peons Basin, in the Uinta Basin of Utah, and finally the Powder River Basin of Wyoming. Today's main presenters will be Kelsey and myself, and we also have the following panelists to answer questions. We've got Laura Johnson, subsurface manager who can answer geologic questions, um, Whitney Lott, senior landman, Taylor Levon, senior operations engineer, and Jennifer Bland, regulatory manager. We'd like to just briefly give the commission and um, those folks listening today, just a brief snapshot of the life cycle of oil and gas projects, um, starting with a discovery phase all the way through a development production and final abandonment phase. And the reason we're giving this snapshot is because this Sylvester Fed OGDP falls into a discovery phase for Anschutz. So Anschutz acquired a shallow gas um, asset that does provide them some infrastructure that can bring gas to market, and they will be utilizing those. The Sylvester Fed location is going to be committed to the Wiley Federal Exploratory Unit, and Anschutz will be developing the, these wells to understand the reservoir and geology in this area, and eventually will plan to develop other, other wells in the area to further understand the asset. So they are right now in a discovery and exploratory phase. They are trying to understand the asset. And as they do, they will move into a development and production phase, which will allow for a bigger overview of utilizing existing and potentially new infrastructure that will tie everything together. The Wiley Exploratory Federal Unit is depicted here on this map. And again, the Sylvester location and wells are committed to this unit, this federal exploratory unit. So this Sylvester Fed location is going to be applicable to the unit agreement for the Wiley unit and to applicable BLM regulations. There are six pro proposed horizontal wells from the Sylvester Fed 0397 12 location that are subject to future BLM determinations um, that are going to be paying Wiley unit wells under the Wiley unit agreement and BLM regulations. All of the planned development for this OGDP are depicted in this orange reddish outline, and they will either be subject to the Wiley unit paying well determination through the Wiley unit agreement, or in the very unlikely event they don't meet those objectives, Anschutz will be coming back to get a spacing order through ECMC. And Whitney Lott is available for further questions on this matter as well. This is a snapshot of the proposed development. So the Sylvester Fed 0397-12, I think we've got a typo there, is located in the northwest, northwest, and northeast, northwest of section 12, Township 3 North, Range 97 West. This is situated on federal surface, and it's going to access unitized minerals again in this Wiley Federal Unit. Anschutz permitted this location concurrently with the BLM and received BLM APD approval November 8th of 2023. 
and it did undergo a rigorous NEPA review, and those documents were provided to the OGLA on February 14th of this year. As Kelsey mentioned, this location falls within Moffitt County. Moffitt County does not have siting regulations dictating where infrastructure for oil and gas is placed. However, they do have an, uh, a county intent to permit to, or to drill permit process that Anschutz will endeavor closer to the time of development. And uh, going the extra mile here, Anschutz does have a road maintenance agreement in place with the adjacent Rio Blanco County that isn't pulled into this location. They're well within, they're over 2000 feet of this county line. However, they've entered into this agreement because there will be some haul traffic that enters into that county. So they're in constant communication with both Rio Blanco and Moffitt County. The Sylvester Fed proposes to develop six horizontal wells with roughly two mile laterals extending north and south. Natural gas and produced water will be piped off of this location. And I know there was a commissioner question on um, the amount of tanks that will be on this location for produced water and oil. And I just wanna make a comment here that because this is still in the development and exploratory phase, Anschutz wanted to provide all of the tanks on this location in the event of excess production. Um, and as they learn more about this asset and the reservoir, they will mitigate and update those on future locations. Oil will be trucked off of location, um, but Anschutz is actively considering future infrastructure for the area, again, in this development and exploratory phase to reduce truck traffic and emissions. The Sylvester Fed 039712 triggers the um, well pad surface being within or immediately upgrade, upgradient of a wetland or ripe, riparian corridor. As such, Anschutz um, assessed this, ish, this situation with the access road and pipeline and received an Army Corps of Engineer permit last um, December. This location also falls into high priority habitat that CPW did not waive. The well pad falls into the elk severe range and winter concentration, as well as the greater sage grouse priority habitat management. And the access road falls within mule deer migration and winter concentration and pronghorn migration corridor. Just wanna give you a little snapshot of the siting considerations that went into this Sylvester Fed location. So first and foremost, Anschutz initial site selection process is the most important tool in avoiding, minimizing and mitigating impacts. As such, this location was selected because of the relatively flat bench of surface here that's going to cause less cut and fill. There's also natural vegetation that would provide a buffer for any interactions with nearby streams in the very unlikely event of a spill. And this topography is optimal for a large enough well pad to develop those six horizontal oil wells, again, two mile lateral stretching north and south. And by utilizing a large enough pad to develop horizontal wells, this will reduce the need for future pads um, as horizontal well development on a multi-well pad is the most efficient way to use the surface. Although this location falls into the greater sage grouse habitat, the location is sited in an area that is less frequented by the species, also making it a more attractive location. This location also provides optimal tie-in to that existing infrastructure and the planned infrastructure for access roads and pipeline routes that will be reutilized in the future on those additional step out locations. And finally, most important, BLM and CPW agreed that this location was the so most suitable to best minimize and mitigate impacts to wildlife. Giving a brief snapshot of the alternative location analysis process, I just wanna to point to the Sylvester alternative location one and three. Those had similar um, impact or similar assessment as the actual location that was selected. They're um, potentially upgrading of a wetland. They're in the um, high priority habitat. They both could access those uh, minerals that were targeted. 
However, the Sylvester II Alt 2 location was immediately dismissed because it was going to require substantial cut and fill. There was going to be a longer access road, and most importantly, it would interfere with a water catch dam for wildlife. So it was immediately dismissed, but alternate locations one and three were potentially viable. This is a snapshot of the robust consultation um, that has occurred with all of the agencies, including CPW and BLM. Um, and then just most noteworthy here, we did receive the NEPA last November that was provided to the OGLA. This is a depiction of the planned phases of operation. Um, and the two most important takeaways here are that Anschutz does intend to develop this in two phases, and this is to accommodate um, the BLM and CPW wildlife timing stipulations. One for big game starting from December 1st to April 30th, and additionally that greater sage grouse lecking from March 1st to July 15th. Anschutz may seek an exception to conduct continuous operations in that first phase of the development, which is allowed under allowed and contemplated under the White River Field Office Resource Management Plan that was amended in 2015. If Anschutz seeks this, they will first go to the BLM for that approval. And then if BLM agrees, Anschutz will provide that to CPW for their review. And if CPW also agrees, Anschutz will provide these um, approvals via Form 4 to ECMC. Also, Anschutz will abide by Rule 1202A, the migratory bird nesting season from April 1st to August 31st, where they will either avoid vegetation removal, or if they plan to conduct vegetation removal, they will conduct a survey prior to doing so. This is a high-level snapshot of Anschutz's wildlife best management practices for big game and sage grouse. Again, adhering to those timing stipulations um, for sure for the sage grouse, and then just a potential brief period may be contemplated in the big game stipulation. Again, that would require the express approval of BLM and CPW. Um, Anschutz agreed to pay. BLM mitigation of indirect adverse impacts. And I just want to note that this was a change from the slides that were previously provided to the commission that stated direct. It's actually the indirect adverse impacts compensatory mitigation payment for sage grouse. Um, this is going to be paid to CPW for the benefit of BLM. And Schutz has also agreed to conduct any trucking of oil off in the daylight hours unless um, there's an upset condition, which is very unlikely. And Anschutz did receive a CPW waiver per Rule 1202A3 for chemical storage within 500 feet of that intermittent drainage. Um, the staging and placement of facilities on the pad has been proposed to avoid impacts to sedimentation and to uh, mitigate any potential spills or releases. And finally, the lack of regular water flow within this mapped area provides further assurances that impacts will be negligible. This is a high level snapshot of the other best management practices that Anschutz has committed to. Um, I won't read all of these to you, but again, wanna point out in that development and production phase that a closed loop system will be utilized, produced water and natural gas will be piped off, and exhaust mufflers will be installed on engines to reduce any impacts to wildlife. And finally, at the very end stage with final reclamation, Anschutz will apply a seed mix approved by and utilized by BLM to restore those native shrubs um, for big game and sage grouse in the area. And this, um, again, is just the slide you saw in the very beginning that Kelsey presented. And that concludes our presentation and we welcome questions. All right, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, commissioners, the panel is open for questions. Commissioner McGowan. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I'm going to leave the wildlife stuff to Commissioner Ackerman. So I, I think I'm still trying to understand the logistics of why, even though this is exploratory, and maybe maybe we're maybe there's several things going on here. If if um, gas and water are going to be piped, I'm trying to understand why four water four water tanks are still necessary for this location, and then for I'm assuming maybe I'm assuming wrong. I, now I need to understand why we have twelve tanks for six wells for oil uh, storage. This seems like a really high ratio to me. Um, when I'm look, you know, we've been doing this long enough to kind of get a gist of what folks are doing on site, and this seems like a a different kind of setup that I'm used to. And so, are are we are we putting in more oil tanks to reduce truck traffic? Are we? I I just I guess I'm just I know you try to brush on this, but I, I guess I'm just not catching it. And I think that, you know, since we're in habitat, I'm just trying to figure out if there's ways that we can minimize impact overall from the size of the pad and all the equipment that might be necessary. So if you could just help me out there, that would be great. Sure thing. I'll take a stab at this and then potentially Jennifer, um, if you want to help reiterate things that I miss. Um, and shoots you know, because this is a new area and because these are going to be two mile horizontal oil wells, they're trying to plan accordingly for these six wells. So because the reservoir and the area is relatively unknown, they just want to make sure they have enough um, tanks on location for produced water and for the oil. And I think as they learn more, they're going to apply those learnings to future well pads. Jennifer, anything else I missed there? Or further explanation? Yeah, the only thing that I would add is that, um, so we, we do have kind of a narrow window. We're only trucking during daylight hours. And because we're the production from these wells is unknown, we just want to have sufficient storage on location. So we're not shutting the wells in an early time, which could affect the reservoir downhole. Um, in addition, having some water tanks on store on location in case there is an upset on the um, water transport transportation line. Uh, we just like to have that there in case there is an upset there, there is a place to store it. And again, as we, you know, finalize what the production looks like from these wells, we can modify the facility design, but this is just based on what we know today. Thank you. And could you please describe um, what it looks like in that, in that area for um, midstream oil um, take away and whether or not that's available or not available and if that was explored. Sure. So we're actively exploring that option. Um, there is not oil takeaway in this immediate vicinity. I believe the nearest oil transportation or midstream line is about 35 miles away from this area. So we're, again, evaluating what the production is going to be, what that infrastructure looks like, sizing it, engineering it, and then finding a viable route from our field to that midstream line. Thank you. So again, just to put a fine tooth, the concept of having additional tanks sounds to me like it's it's more precautionary than anything else because you just are uncertain of what is going to happen here. Yes, absolutely. It's, you know, again, exploratory phase. So they're making sure they have enough tanks on location to handle the produced water and the oil production. Okay, thank you. Other commissioners with questions for the panel? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few questions because I'm I'm struggling a little bit with, with understanding how what's being proposed is tying into the form 2a associated with bmps and um right now it seems like there's a little bit of a disconnect between what i hear the operator proposing what cpw is proposing or is contemplating in their um consultation and what's actually in the form 2a associated with the bmps and so I do have just a few questions about that. First, before I get into that though, um, 
I, I'm, I'm trying to get a better picture um, with the associated truck traffic with the oil takeaway, um, understanding that it's going to be trucked, understanding that there are some stipulations that are put on that as, uh, regarding daylight hours, but understanding it's also occurring through, you know, year round. Uh, so through the timing stipulations, what kind of volumes of trucks are we seeing? Um, Unfortunately, when I was trying to access the cumulative impacts data on our website, it was not available to me. And so I didn't have the opportunity to review that. Okay, so first question sounds like you, you wanna understand the volume of truck traffic for the oil coming off of location. We gotcha. will have that down right now, unless Jennifer, you have that in front of you at the moment. I don't have specific numbers. Um, I could just generalize. So go ahead and generalize. Sure. I'll, I would offer that um, initial, these, these wells generally come on at higher rates. So there would be initially more truck traffic. Um, I'm trying to remember what our former location, the results on that one, but um, probably multiple trucks per day um, in early phase. And then as, you know, post six months, we might be looking at one to, you know, one truck a day hauling oil out. Again, as, as they all, it's all different. Every location is going to be different and the production will be different. So um, again, this is just based on, on what we've seen so far on our other locations. And um, looking at the dust plan that Anschutz provided, there's an estimated 6,570 maximum truck trips, but this is going to be over the period of 360 months. So that's the whole lifetime of the production. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then, so in, in the, in the form 2A, it clearly states that the timing stipulations associated with greater sage grouse are going to be um, abided by. Um, however, there's no clarity as far as the timing stipulations associated with you know, any of the other high priority habitats or, or winter concentration areas or um, big game species. Certainly in your presentation uh, and in tables that you provided, there's some indication that timing stipulations generally are going to be um, generally are going to be abided by, although it does appear that maybe 30 days the uh, interference um, in phase one and maybe five five days or a week interference in phase two. Um, I'm trying to understand how that gets memorialized into the form 2A because without a best management practices that memorializes that, I don't understand how that gets um, locked in as a best management practice. Otherwise, we're approving we're approving a form 2A that would give you the ability to um, not actually abide by those timing stipulations. Sure. So. CPW and BLM cannot give us those timing stipulation ex exceptions at the permitting stage. Um, the White River Field Office Resource Management Plan dictates that we request that exception if needed closer to the time of development. And that's so that BLM can assess that request in real time, taking a look at the species and the situation at that moment. And then likewise, CPW would not give us an exception right here at the outset. Again, they want to take a look at that closer to the time of that request to determine whether or not the species would be impacted. I can um, state that construction is probably the most um, interfering situation. So again, construction would be completely um, conducted outside of those timing stipulations. And you are correct, it looks like Anschutz is considering potentially requesting an exception for those first 30 days in that phase one of the big game timing stipulation. But because we've got to request that through the timing exception request that's kind of laid out in that 2015 RMP, Anschutz is going to request that closer to the time and BLM can say no. 
Um, and BLM can say yes, we could send that to CPW and they could say no too. So it's completely at their discretion. It's not a given at this point, but mostly well, just guess, to answer. Let me, let me take a step back there a little bit because CPW doesn't technically have any regulatory authority over this. It's ECMC that has the regulatory authority over it. And so in order for CPW to be able to make a determination that an exception is warranted, there would first need to be a BMP included in the Form 2A that required adherence to that timing stipulation. And then an exception could be granted in consult by ECMC in consultation with CPW utilizing a Form 4 or other mechanism. But without the BMP in the Form 2A, there's really no mechanism to do that. And so the only regulatory body that would be able to um, make a determination on that timing stipulation would be the BLM. And so that makes me a little uncomfortable because it doesn't seem clear process wise, that that's an appropriate path. And I'm not sure whether CPW understood that parameter or not. And so would, would love to hear from Taylor Elm if he was available as to at least what he understood the particular situation to be and whether it's been captured in the ECMC form 2A appropriately in order to be able to, I mean, I understand the intent, right? And so I'm hearing you with the intent, I'm just not sure it's captured correctly in our forms. Um, and so, um, so I don't know, is Taylor available? And Commissioner Messner, while we're potentially looking for Taylor to bring him on as a panelist, and Schutz did sit with him last week to kind of go over what we're looking here on that PowerPoint and the potential to request that, um, but I'll let him go ahead and pipe in. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, for the record, Taylor Elm, Northwest Energy Liaison for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, I may have missed a touch there as I was elevated to panelists, but I, I think I definitely understand your, your question, Commissioner. And in thinking about that, I, I agree with you. I, I think if, if Anschutz is um, amenable to that approach, I do think the appropriate way, as you described it, would to have the actual stipulation with CPW's recommended dates on the 2A and then, as Ms. Hill was describing at the time, if that exception is needed for any of those activities, um, it would be requested via sundry kind of at the same time that the federal timing limitation was requested. And so I, I do think that would probably be the approach that makes the most sense. I think what was recorded and kind of memorialized in the wildlife mitigation plan was these pre-application discussions that we had of kind of trying to thread the needle um, with the, the two-phase approach and the various timing limitations that are applicable at this location. So we do appreciate Anschutz's effort to, to um, really do the best and, and have that disturbance also occur on the front end um, going into those winter range periods versus the back end is kind of something we consider. And then the only other thing I would add is that um, at the time, if an exception request was uh, made by Anschutz to BLM and CPW, we would likely, and, and this is what we typically do, assess if additional compensatory mitigation would be necessary to kind of address those impacts during the sensitive season. And I think we've struggled with that a little bit of how to address that, that flexibility or that unknown with timing during the, the time of permitting. And um, potentially assessing more indirect impact mitigation later on when that TL exception comes up. And so one approach we've talked about is, is if a TL exception is made that that form for sundry would also include any amended or extra mitigation amounts that would be associated with that. And I don't know if that is acceptable to the commission, um, but kind of a, a way that we've looked at it that may be kind of a approach to account for some of that unknown in timing. Well, thanks, Taylor. I appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Appreciate the explanation, um, and uh, and and I think that makes sense. Again, I'm I'm not saying that the that the applicant is um, 
you know, not committing to these things. And, and certainly I think they've been clear in their presentation as far as what their intent is, but I wanna make sure that that's captured in the form 2A and that the appropriate BMPs are there so that should there be, um, should the applicant be interested in, in providing a form four, and of course any change to an OGDP would have to have a determination of whether it's a substantial change or whether it's a change that can be done with a form four sundry. So that determination, at least from this commissioner's understanding would need to be made, um, but there has to be a basis for that. And you know, I certainly see the timing stipulations in the form 2A that CPW has proposed, but I don't see it carried down in the form 2A as something that the operator has agreed to. And so, um, so unless someone is seeing something different than I am, I, I um, AG Mercer. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Messner. So I was going to chime in that that I do see these BMPs on um, page 10 of the 2A. They are under the CPW proposed wildlife BMPs, um, but I believe those have the same force and effect as the as BMPs that would be elsewhere on the form 2A. So it, in my view, these are, are in the 2A unless um, someone feel wants to correct me on that. <laughs> I'm okay with Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, Anchu certainly agrees to codify any 2As committed to in a plan on the 2A itself. I think there's maybe some confusion when a plan is submitted with commitments and um, staff may not want those carried on onto the 2A <laughs> itself. They're kind of codified in the plan. But I agree with Ms. Mez with Mercer um, that the CPW recommend recommendations are on the 2A as it stands. Commissioner Messner, further? Um, no, Allen. that's fine. As long as, it, as it's uh, determined that they're carried, you know, when I when I look at that, I think in some two ways I've seen that there's what CPW has proposed and then there's what the operator has agreed to and that, you know, the the that gets carried on further into the two way. But um, I'm okay with that if, um, if folks agree that that's what the intent is and it's captured in the two way. Okay. Great, good discussion. Further questions for the panel? All right, seeing no further questions, we move into the deliberation phase of this proposal. Does anyone care to initiate deliberations? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Messner addressing those timing uh, limitations from the 2A. Um, I wanted to hit just a couple of points, and one of these points is applicable to this application, but certainly applicable to many applications, particularly on the Western Slope, and that's the issue of the uh, CPW granted 1202A3 waiver, which allows chemical storage uh, in proximity to a development. Just wanted to remind us that uh, the USGS hydrographic water layer mapping was used during the mission change rulemaking, and that's the maps that are referred to when we're talking about potential waterways that developments are impacting. And those maps are very, very broad. Uh, we recognized at the time of rulemaking that many of those map flows would mostly be dry washes and drainages. And we purposefully used that broad approach <clears throat> so that uh, we would be required at any point to address any potential waterways that were near to and affected by developments. Uh, you know, in the cases of uh, drainages that rarely contain water, uh, we determined at the time, and I continue to believe that a waiver with adequate containment BMPs was an expected process. It gave us an opportunity to look at it and, and state that a waiver was appropriate. And I do think that that's appropriate in this case and wanted to reiterate that in often in cases on the Western Slope, you'll hear uh, a common waiver of this regulation uh, and wanted to reiterate the process by which we came to that uh, uh, procedure. Um, as always, to me, this is a presentation to the commission after the culmination of lots and lots of preparatory work. And uh, a lot of that work was centered on wildlife and the protection thereof. Um, 
This development does take place in CPW mapped high priority habitat, as do many developments on the Western Slope. And there has been significant consultation and best management practices, concessions, timing restrictions, and mitigation, uh, particularly with the clarification uh, that uh, Commissioner Messner has helped us get to. Um, in addition to a full NEPA process, as this development is to take place on federal land, and uh, CPW was extensively involved in the discussions and states that it doesn't have any unresolved issues or objections to this permit application. I think that this is a good uh, application for a, a development uh, in wildlife habitat with appropriate VMPs, appropriate stipulations. Um, I, I do. I do want to keep an eye on oil transportation, appreciate the daylight hour oil transportation, and I uh, wanted to state for the record that we certainly would prefer oil takeaway uh, to the extent that it's available as well, and I certainly feel that way also. Uh, something that didn't really come out during the presentation is uh, we certainly talked about compensatory mitigation and the compensatory mitigation program and that there would be payments in the compensatory mitigation program. and. Really, as I understand it, there are two forms of, well, three forms of compensatory mitigation going on here. Uh, under our regulations, direct compensatory mitigation paid to CPW, uh, and then, um, uh, uh, so maybe just two kinds, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. And then that got to a total of around $70,000. Uh, and then after a process with BLM, pursuant to their 2015 Northwest Colorado Greater Sage Grouse Resource Management Plan, an additional 55,000 in indirect impacts was also assessed and being agreed to through this uh, application. If I'm wrong in that assessment, I hope someone will correct me. But as per my calculations, that puts the compensatory mitigation total uh, at 125,000 and change, uh, as I heard during the presentation that the intent was to pay the BLM requested compensatory mitigation through our program to CPW as well. So I wanted to point that out, uh, that that's how I understand it and hope someone will correct me if that's wrong. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm in support of this application. I, I appreciate the extensive consultation. I appreciate the process uh, involving CPW and BLM uh, and the, uh, the uh, BMPs that have been arrived to here. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman, um, well said. Any further deliberative thoughts? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner Ackerman, for leading off there. I thought that was very helpful. Um, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment with regard to the, the tanks being used here, because I know that that came up in question as well. Um, I, I do think that it's it's appropriate, a while, while a unique situation for for sure, I do think that this is appropriate here, given the exploratory nature and the distance of setting up an oil pipeline at this time would obviously be difficult given that exploratory nature. Um, and so I think more as a forewarning to to future applicants, we're, we're probably not gonna have a lot of situations where this number of tanks is going to be an, an okay situation to propose, but, um, Given the exploratory nature, given the the different timing restrictions that are there, I do think it is both as as Chair Robbins indicated a, a precaution. Um, it is appropriate for the limitations provided in this area until such time that um, sufficient production can be shown to extend that pipeline that thirty five miles that they talked about. Commissioner Messner, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with the Clarification on the form two A. I am in a uh, uh, support of this application. Um, I do appreciate, as Commissioner Ackerman indicated, the um, significant work that's been done with CPW in trying to address wildlife. Um, I will just highlight one um, thing that gives me a little bit of heartburn is um, the understanding that there is some anticipation for continuous operations in phase one and understand that's not being um, proposed in this particular application, but understanding that it's out there, um, you know, to me, that certainly could be a significant change uh, to an OGDP approval. Um, although ultimately the director will have to make that decision um, 
but is is significantly different than what's being proposed here from a timing stipulation standpoint. But um, but I am in support of the application as presented. Anything else? Commissioner, I would move approval of the application. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Motion and uh, two seconds. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we uh, have approved that application for these exploratory wells in Moffat County. Thank you. Thank Let's you. take 10. Let's return at uh, 1014. Uh, <clears throat> the commission will next take up docket 23100322, a Crestone Peak Resources LLC OGDP, the BJU 365-1924 North. And with that, uh, I see that we've got Mr. Noto with us. Did you have some preliminary remarks, Mr. Noto? Yeah, just a brief statement. Um, hi, I'm John Noto. I'm a, one of the location assessment supervisors. Um, Actually, John, uh, hold on just a sec. Let me make sure we've got Commissioner Ackerman with us as well. Sure. There he is. I'm sorry, I saw you all and didn't see myself and didn't notice. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Noto. Sure, just a brief note about the Bijou uh, 3 65 19 24 North OGDP. Uh, the director recommendation uh, has information in it that the CDPHE best management practices were committed to on November 30th, 2023. Um, that date should actually be March 8th, 2024. And that's, that's the only in, uh, correction that we have today. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions about that date correction? Seeing none, we'll let you go back to your daily business. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right, Ms. Jost, do you want to elevate your witnesses? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Annabelle, Ms. Ehlers, and Mr. Barkus, if you can please come on screen, Ms. Mercer will swear you in. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I believe we also have a public comment from Mr. Howard Boygan uh, on this particular matter as well. Okay, uh, very good. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and take, well, let's go ahead and get these witnesses sworn in since they're all visualized and then we'll take the public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to the panel. Um, I will just go one by one and ask you to raise your right hand, state your name and that you swear to tell the truth. I'll begin with Mr. Farkas. Hi, Scott Farkas. I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Mr. Annabel. My name is Jeff Annabel, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Ms. Ehlers. Natalie Ehlers. I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll now move to public comment. Uh, the esteemed Howard Boygan, please, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, commissioners. Nice to see everybody. I'm Howard Boygan, resident of Denver, Colorado. I'm an attorney and appear today representing the surface owners of the land covered by Crestone's pending OGTP application number 231-000322, the Bijou 3-6519-24. You'll recall that I appeared before you last December in support of another Crestone OGDP application on the same property that was the King South OGDP, which you subsequently approved. The surface owners support this additional application and urge its speedy approval. This location, like the previous one, is on the Aurora Energy and Technology Center being developed by my clients. It is part of the Aurora Highlands master planned mixed use community in the city of Aurora, south of the airport and east of E-470. As I advised you last December, the Aurora Highlands is under active development and will contain some 12,500 homes and 60,000 residents. 
including the full range of social, cultural, and economic activities and institutions of a thriving community. The Energy and Technology Center, or ATEC, is on the eastern edge of the project. It was acquired and is designed to accommodate energy and other light industrial operations and segregate them from the residential community. As I discussed with you last December, Crestone and its predecessor, Conoco Phillips, negotiated with us over a period of several years regarding the relocation of their planned wells from the heart of the Aurora Highlands project to the ATEC. Over time, these negotiations resulted in a reduction in the number of locations and a consolidation and relocation of planned well pads to areas with less environmental and surface impacts. It is one of those relocated pads that is before you today. This revised and relocated Bijou North pad has been moved from the location originally negotiated with Conoco in order to accommodate planned surface development and avoid intersecting the Second Creek flood district. In the director's consideration of the comprehensive area plan containing the original location, staff recommended this move to minimize impacts on surface water drainages. Crestone has been responsive to our concerns, which has been very helpful to our surface planning. The city of Aurora has also been very supportive of this project and, uh, and of the relocation, which was memorialized in amendment to the operator agreement that ConocoPhillips originally negotiated with the city. I think that the city has actually also issued its permit for this location. Under Crestone's proposed plan, pad construction will commence in July of this year and the wells should be completed by the fourth quarter. This is critical from my client's standpoint because it will precede surface development in the ATEC. Therefore, we urge the commission to grant approval of this application so that drilling can begin as soon as possible to meet this deadline. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Boygan, for the public comment on behalf of the surface owner. Are there questions for Mr. Boygan? All right, we're seeing no questions. Again, we appreciate your time. Uh, commissioners, as I think I did last December uh, in a former life that now seems light years away, I actually represented the city of Aurora in some of those negotiations. I do not believe that serves as a conflict and I am able to uh, be a commissioner here without any impartiality uh, unless someone thinks otherwise. Seeing no one thinking otherwise, I will maintain myself as chair and as a commissioner on this application. All right, Ms. Jost, you are up. Wonderful, thank you, chair. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I may. Okay, Chair, can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Well, good morning, commissioners, staff, and members of the public. My name is Jamie Jost of Jost Energy Law, and I, along with my partner, Kelsey Wazalinki, represent Crestone Peak Resources Operating LLC on this Bijou 3-65, 19-64 North OGDP application that was filed on October 13th, 2023, and is before you today in docket number 23100322. Crestone would like to thank the city of Aurora, sorry, let me flip my screen here, um, for its participation through the local permitting process and its approval of the one oil and gas location subject to this OGDP. We would like to thank the ECMC staff and the director for their efforts on this OGDP as well as the box elder cap under which the OGDP has been filed. We're also grateful to Mr. Boygan and his clients for providing the comments this morning. As a quick refresher, the box elder cap was approved by this commission in order number 535-1396 on November 2nd, 2022. The order established an approximate 37,520 acre cap for the um, development of the Nibrera, Codell, Greenhorn, and JSAN formations. As you can see on this slide, the Bijou North location is located in the northern area of the Box Elder Cap and is within the city of Aurora. 
At the CAP hearing, Crestone did not seek and the commission did not grant preliminary siting approval for the Bijou North Pad. And as you will hear today, there's no Rule 304 ALA criteria that applies to this Bijou North Pad. In terms of the OGDP submittal, Crestone complied with all notice requirements of the OGDP and no formal petitions were filed. Um, we appreciate the question received from the commissioners yesterday, and we will address that question through the course of the presentation today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Jeff Annabelle, Manager for Well and Location Permitting for Crestone to present the OGDP application to this commission. Thank you, Jamie, and good morning, commissioners. Uh, can you all hear me? Thank you for taking the time to consider our Bijou North OGDP. My name is Jeff Annabel, Manager, Well and Location Permitting for Civitas Resources. First, I would like to go over some general facts about the OGDP. The Bijou North OGDP is a 3,837.39 acre OGDP that will be developed by 12 wells located on a single pad that Bijou 3-65, 19-24 North location, which is a 20 acre location located in section 21, township three South, range 65 West. The relevant local government is the city of Aurora who has approved our oil and gas permit for the proposed development. There are no residential building units, schools or child care centers, high occupancy building units or designated outdoor activity areas within one mile of the proposed location. The pad is located within a DI community polygon, but again, the nearest RBU is greater than one mile away. An ALA was not required for this location and we received no public comments during review. We had our CDPHE consultation on March 5th and CPW did not request a consult due to the absence of any high priority habitats within one mile of the location. Next slide. Now I'd like to cover our subsurface plant development plans. As mentioned, we will drill 12 new wells to develop the proposed mineral development area, which consists of eight three mile wells and four two mile wells. These wells will be governed by 330 foot unit setbacks and 150 50 foot inner well setbacks. Now I would like to take a moment to answer a commission question regarding the original siting of the Bijou pad during the cap process. Since the box elder cap was approved, Crestone has worked closely with the surface owner, the city of Aurora, and other stakeholders on the siting of the Bijou North pad site. Relative to the conceptual siting presented with the box elder cap, the new site is a quarter mile to the southeast and is more protective of surface water resources as it was relocated outside of a mile high flood district designated stream. It's better aligned with the surface owner's ultimate development plans, and it's aligned with the city of Aurora via an amendment to the operator agreement, as well as it was designed to share infrastructure, roads, electrical pipelines, et cetera, with an adjacent non-crestone operated pad. Next slide. Next, I would like to cover the Bijou North OGDP offset well status. There are eight existing producing horizontal wells within the proposed DSU that will continue to produce to their original DSUs, as well as two legacy verticals that have been or will be re-entered for offset well evaluation requirements as a part of the Form 2 process. Next slide. If approved, Crestone anticipates beginning construction in the second quarter of 2024 followed by drilling in the third quarter and completions in the fourth quarter. Following completions, the wells will are currently slated to be brought online in the first quarter of 2025. Next slide. Next, I would like to cover the Bijou North siding. As mentioned before, we do not trigger any ALA criteria as a result of the proposed siding. The nearest cultural feature is over a mile away and there are no high priority habitats within one mile of the location. Next slide. The Bijou North pad is sited within the city of Aurora and is, in, and is governed by the operator agreement that was approved by the city. We submitted the individual local permit on September 25th, 2023, which was approved on April 3rd, 2024. Next slide. Now I'd like to cover community outreach that was performed. Crestone held a neighborhood meeting pursuant to Aurora regulations on March 5th, 2023. During that meeting, no comments were registered. 
Next slide. Next, I would like to cover Crestone's proposed mitigations and mitigation investigations that were performed as a part of the Bijou North OGDP preparation. Cumulative impact mitigations that were performed for the OGDP include electrification of pre-production and production operations. And I'm happy to report that Crestone has paid to upgrade the electrical infrastructure to support a grid power drilling rig and facility electrification. Per the latest estimates from Excel, the upgrades should be complete prior to SPUD. Additionally, we looked into a produced water pipeline to the nearest disposal facility. The totem, SWD number one, is 17 miles to the northeast as the crow flies, and Crestone estimates the actual alignment of the pipeline would be closer to 24 miles. Notwithstanding the economic burden of building a pipeline of this magnitude, we estimate this length of pipe would generate approximately 6,000 truck trips, disturb approximately 97 acres of land, cross two high priority habitats, and cross 14 mapped rivers and streams. Crestone does not believe the, that the amount of produced water truck traffic generated from the pad would offset the economic and most importantly, environmental impacts of constructing a pipeline of this magnitude. Next slide. Now I'd like to go over site-specific mitigation measures. Prior to construction, additional avian surveys will be performed to ensure there are no conflicts. Fresh water will be used on the access road to minimize dust. The topsoil stockpiles will be constructed with slopes no greater than four to one and will be stabilized with appropriate vegetation to provide both short and long-term stabilization. Next slide. During drilling, we intend on utilizing a grid-powered electric rig, which is dependent on XL construction timelines. If there is an unforeseen delay in the electrical infrastructure build-out, Crestone will use a Tier 4 equivalent natural gas with battery backup powered rig, or if available, a Tier 4 rig. We will utilize Group 3 drilling mud to mitigate odors, sound walls around the site for drilling and completion operations to mitigate noise, and a polyethylene liner as a spill prevention measure. Additionally, we will also employ pipe cleaning procedures when removing the drill string from the hole, use a closed loop drilling system, and store drill cuttings in a closed container prior to being trucked off site to a commercial disposal site. Crestone will utilize the following site specific mitigation measures during completion operations. We'll utilize a temporary lay flat water line to source water, reducing a large amount of truck traffic. A tier four equivalent or better completion fleet will be used to reduce emissions. Sealed sandbox containers will be used for transportation and storage of stand. Flowback will be routed through emission control production facilities. Additionally, Crestone will employ the best management practices listed below, in addition to what I've mentioned already. Next slide. And finally, during production operations, we will have a utility powered production facility, oil and gas pipelines prior to first production, tank blowers that greatly minimize emissions associated with storage tanks, and pre a pressurized maintenance vessel that eliminates venting associated with maintenance operations. The produced water traffic will equate to approximately 28 round trip truck trips per day during the first year, and an average of two or less round trip trip truck trips per day for the life of the well. Additionally, we have confirmed that our produced water trucking fleet is 90% tier four. We will also have remote shut-in capabilities, equipment that blends with the surrounding landscape and air monitoring for the life of the wells. Next slide. I would like to thank the director and ECMC staff for their thorough evaluation of the Bijou North OGDP and subsequent director's recommendation of approval that was issued on April 19th. Next slide. Finally, I would like to request the commission approve the approximate 3,837.39 acre Bijou North OGDP allowing for 12 new horizontal wells to be developed from one new oil and gas location, the Bijou 3-65, 19-24 North location that is located within the OGDP boundary. That concludes our slide deck. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Annabelle. Ms. Jost, anything to finish up? 
Nope, that is it, Chair. If I could just ask Ms. Ehlers and Mr. Farkas to join us for um, our subject matter panel, that would be great. And we're open to questions. Thank you. All right, Commissioners, the panel is open for questions. Well, you must have done a good job. I'm not seeing very many questions. Um, I, as one commissioner, appreciate the support of the surface owner, appreciate the support of the relevant local government, appreciate the fact that the siting is done smartly and in accord with uh, development plans and that they, the wells are proposed to be drilled ahead of the residential development. Um, all of that uh, seems to me to be um, well done. Uh, any other commissioners with thoughts? Does any commissioner desire to make a motion? Commissioner Cross? I move for approval of the application. I'll second. A motion and a second to approve the application. Any further deliberative thoughts on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Jost. Uh, thank you to our staff for the good work here. And um, we have concluded our business for today. I would move to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you, folks.